Hey there, cousin here, and welcome back to Always Doing. Today I'm coming at you guys with my May wrap-up part one. Now normally, if I have two wrap-ups in a month, I'll do one mid-month, and then I'll do another one at the end. However, when I was at mid-month, I looked at my list and I thought, oh, I've only finished a couple of books. I'm There's no need. And so I didn't. But by the time I got to the end of the month, I still had only finished five books, which for me is a one-part wrap-up. However, I've DNF'd five. And I'm going to talk about those two. So yeah, more than one video. This month my focus was to read nonfiction about Japanese history and culture, both by Japanese people and not by Japanese people, and also to fit in any kind of nonfiction I wanted as long as it was written and I read it in Japanese. So that was successful. The rest of my reading though, not so much. But at least we start on a high note. The first book I finished was Hiroshima by John Hersey. It is a journalistic account of the aftermath of the bombing of Hiroshima, especially the first year after, and there's also an afterword of one chapter that talks about 40 years after. It follows six people, and it is very well written, and it's very illuminating. The less you know about Hiroshima, the more you will get out of this book. However, I do have quibbles, and I had so much to say, in fact, that I did a full review, which I will link down below. The next book was a DNF. It was Saikyo no Benkyo Ho by Inomate Takenori. It translates as basically the strongest study method, and this is a whole genre of books. There are so many standardized tests that Japanese people need to do, and like this whole idea of how to study, the best way to study, the most efficient way to study, how to get the most out of your time. It's a whole section of the bookstore, basically. A bunch of the content can overlap, but it's usually based on the author's own experience. They talk about what they did, maybe there's a certain piece of technology they used that really helped them, or something particular to their situation. You know, Mata um, went to medical school, in Japan, which is not an easy feat already. And then it's kind of unclear, but he went to Boston and I think he was working as a resident, maybe a junior doctor, but I got the feeling it was more like a resident. And while he was there, he also got an MBA um, from Harvard. So the whole idea on the cover at least, is how did this person get two completely different professional degrees and how did they manage their studying and stuff? The tone for many, of these books, and I think that's because it works, is I did this amazing thing and so can you. However, his tone was I did this amazing thing with nothing else after it. And it was just like listening to him brag for the first 70 pages, which is how far I got before I DNF'd it. There was nothing new for me, no new insights. I wasn't interested in his story. Just, yeah, I was good. After that, I picked up another book for this Japanese nonfiction project, In Praise of Shadows by Tanizaki Jun Ichiro, translated by Harper and Sidon Sticker, and I loved this. This was a five-star read. I first heard about it from Sean over at Sean the Book Maniac, and he described it as a grumpy old man talking about Japanese aesthetics. And that's what it is. And the, there's so much that's coming together here. Tanizaki has written bunches of stuff, I believe it's mostly fiction, the Marioka Sisters, I think is his most famous work. This book was written in 1933, and in it he's looking back at like maybe the 1880s, 1890s, an era before electricity, and he's reflecting on that and how awesome it was, and this is something that's pointed out in the afterword, but he's looking back not as a celebrant, but as a mourner someone who's seeing this world that has gone away and he knows it's never going to come back. It's basically a long essay and it's kind of rambling because there's an ideal in Japanese letters to follow the brush. So it doesn't necessarily follow with, I think shadows are great and this is why. Um, it's more not stream of consciousness, it's obviously very well thought out when it was put together, but it just leads you from one area to the other. And in the process he talks about how shadow uh, used to have a really important place in Japanese life because, well, first of all, there's no electricity. So when you have dinner, it's lit by candlelight. And if the room is of a decent size, there's only going to be darkness around the corners and in the shadows and how that adds to the enjoyment of the meal. And he laments that people today, which for him was 1933, wouldn't know the particular quality of that darkness. He talks about the dark lacquer bowls that are used to serve soup and how when you look into one, if it's a clear soup, 
you have really no idea what you're getting into when you raise it up to your lips. There's no hint as to what the flavor might be like and how that adds to the experience of the meal and of eating. There are other little side tangents and things, and one that I found particularly interesting is he was talking about how the Western world um, came up with scientific principles and scientific thought earlier than Japan or other um, cultures in Asia and how he wondered how much that affected how we think about science. He's like, what if a Japanese person, like, quote-unquote, discovered or at least put together physics? Maybe it would have been organized differently. Maybe the laws would have um, been brought together in a different way to match the Japanese aesthetic and the Japanese thought, which is very different from that of the West. The writing is gorgeous. I don't know how much of that to attribute to the translators, but Oh, another thing I liked is that the foreword and the afterword are well placed, well written, and well thought out. The foreword doesn't give too much away. I hate it when the foreword it lets you know everything that's going to happen, and it's like this turning point at the end is important because, and you just want to go no, like it's well done. And the afterword added more insights and gave me more to think about, and I was just oh, I love this my first five-star read of the year. Normally by this time of year I would have two, maybe three five-star reads, but I'll take all that I can get and this is a great one. The next book is New Ink on Life by Jenny Davis. I received it as an advanced copy from Karina Press and it came out on May 27th. I was drawn to this FF romance because of the jacket copy, namely that Cassie is a survivor of breast cancer. She's almost at five years cancer-free, which is a big landmark, and she feels like she can't really start or really get entrenched in any kind of life until then. Before cancer, she had a kind of corporate, dare I say boring, job, but um, after her diagnosis, she decided that she wants to be a tattoo artist. So she apprentices with this really awesome artist, but unfor unfortunately, that artist dies. She has a few months left on her apprenticeship, and so she ends up going to another disciple, if you want to call it that, of that artist, to finish up the time. That is MJ. MJ has her own shop. She has a lot of drama with her ex-lover. She has business isn't as good as it could be. There's drama with some of the other artists working there. It's just, it's a mess. What MJ has in spades is tough attitude, won't take anything from anyone, and she's very strong in that sense. On the other hand, Cassie is acquiesces to just about everything. She doesn't stand up for herself. So when she comes to do this apprenticeship, MJ's like, this isn't going to work out because you can't even like stand up for yourself. This is awful. And they end up coming to an agreement. Cassie, who has business sense, will help with the shop, with social media, with, you know, finding better advertising, all this kind of business stuff, as well as doing some art. And MJ will teach her how to have a backbone. I also like the focus that's given to mastectomy tattoos, and if you've never heard of those, it's, um, mastectomy is the removal of the breast, and it's usually done for breast cancer, some other things as well. So what some women do, some because they, it's aesthetically pleasing, some to kind of cover the scar, there's many different reasons, but some women get these huge, wonderful, beautiful tattoos on their chest over the scars. So I will let you Google that if you're interested, though you may have to turn the safe search function off because Google's kind of picky about mastectomy, it's weird, but yeah, but check that out if you're interested. Anyway, Cassie, breast cancer survivor, and she has a knack for helping people who want this kind of tattoo and is helping design it and stuff. So that's in there, I think that's great. However, I DNF'd this at 82 pages. And the reason being that this whole, MJ's gonna teach Cassie how to get a backbone, right? So she's kind of helping her stand up for herself, kind of pushing her a little too hard in the sense waiting to get a reaction from her, and that's all fine. But there's a scene where MJ says, hey, I want you to come to the shop after hours. And Cassie's like, why? He's like, well, you're gonna be doing a tattoo. And Cassie's like, oh my God, I'm gonna be tattooing my mentor. This is a huge thing. And blah, and she starts freaking out, but she gets there and MJ uh, role plays a really crappy customer. Like, who's like, I want a butterfly, but that not that kind of butterfly. Makes her redraw it 15 times and cut, finally comes up with something that MJ, the so-called customer, likes. That's all fine. But then MJ says, tattoo it on yourself. And this is a tattoo that Cassie doesn't necessarily want. She didn't think she was getting a tattoo today. 
and to just be like, hey, tattoo that on yourself. And she does so with no pushback whatsoever. And MJ's supposed to be teaching her how to get a spine, right? Mm -hmm. And here, Cassie does exactly what she says with zero pushback. And this is seen as a good thing. And I know everyone's going to think about tattoos differently, but for me, I would like to see that it's a really well thought out decision. I always kind of cringe when somebody gets a tattoo when they're drunk or on a whim or something. It's just something that I, I'm different than other people, but that I feel should be, you know, well thought out and it's permanent. So you should just really think through shit that's permanent. And she just goes, okay, and tattoos it on her hip. So that really turned me off. And then looking at some other reviews from other people who got advanced copies, uh, MJ's attitude doesn't really improve until late, late, late in the book. And I just, I was done. And then after that, again, back to the Japanese nonfiction is The Chrysanthemum and the Sword, Patterns in Japanese Culture by Ruth Benedict. I have another full review about this one because, oh, the thoughts. I did a buddy read of it with Municorn from A Bookish Land. I will link her down below. It was really great to read it with her because she is Chinese, she lives in America, I'm American, I live in Japan, and my husband's Japanese. So between all of us, we were able to get some really interesting perspectives and thoughts and bouncing things off each other about whether we thought she was right or not. Because Benedict wrote this book during World War II and she was unable to go to Japan because World War II. And so she did everything from secondary sources, all of her research, movies, talking to Japanese Americans, talking to Japanese people who had come to America, all of this stuff. And while she gets some things right, she gets many, many things wrong. And it was very frustrating to pick through the wheat and the chaff. So. Um, I'll leave it there for now, but if you'd like more complete thoughts, do check out that full review, which I'll link. And the last book I have for you in part one here is The Big Green Tent by Ludmila Ulitskaya, translated either by Polly Gannon or Bella Shaevich, and I don't know which because one name is on the cover and the other name is in the copyright, and I'm confused, but it's one of them. The story mostly revolves around three boys growing up in Moscow during very tumultuous times in the Soviet Union and how they led their mostly dissident lives and things they had to deal with and face and their relationships and all kinds of stuff. This book is against my grain. However, Olive over at A Book Olive did a readathon for it and there's a Goodreads group and I loved that part of it, being able to talk with everybody about the book, get all these different insights, to know I wasn't alone, if there was something I was confused about, that was really great. But it hurts me to say this, but it just it ended up not being a book for me. I liked the beginning. We get to see these three boys growing up, how they meet, I think it's like in the end of primary school and then into middle school how they absolutely love their literature professor and all of that stuff, super interesting. But then once we get through that and we get into a little bit of them starting to get married and going off on their own ways, we learn very early about how one of these characters dies. That seems a little weird because it's only a third of the way through the book. And then the whole thing kind of resets and we end up going back to when they're young again, but we're seeing a different set of stories. And so you have to kind of interleave all this new information into what you already know. And then you'll be able to work out the timeline for yourself. And now that you have new information, it affects what you thought. Something like that plot wise, I think could work, but this one just didn't work for me. I think part of it was the very large cast list and Part of me wished that I had taken really good notes right from the beginning and never stopped to help keep track of everybody to who is whose aunt and uncle and grandmother and who had a fling with whom, all of this stuff to try and get it in my mind. At the other time, I ended up, especially at the end of my reading, like just trying to think of it as vignettes. Like this is a cute story. Okay. This is another short story. Okay. And when you read them on their own like that, it's not they're kind of readable, but then once I got to the end, it clicked who that person was. I'm like, oh, it's that guy over there. And then to go through that mental work to fit them back, and it, it kind of, it wasn't for me. If you have an interest in background in Russia, I think you will like this more than me, especially if you like Russian history, because there's lots of little neat Easter eggs and things that went over my head because I had no idea. But for me personally, I got to page 299 which I thought was really good because for most books that would be most of the book and here it was only about half, but I got there, 
before I ended up DNFing it. And like I said, I loved the experience of reading with the read-along and they're a good chunk of the reason why I was able to get to page 299, so I'm thankful for that. So there we have it, part one of my May wrap-up. Have you read any of these books? Are you thinking about reading them now? How was your May? Am I the only one that had all these DNFs? Let's have a gab down in the comments. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you're new, and I will see you in the next video. Bye!